and last recording. Hello and welcome. So for those of you who've just joined us, I'm Gavin Stone. I'm the host today with my wonderful longtime friend and guest, Thomas Pecora. Um, he has a 30-year um, background uh, and, and what an amazing career in both security and a 24-year um, career. I'm making a mess of this. <laughs> in the CIA security section uh, as, an, as an officer for the uh, CIA security. Um, I do, I, there's so much about Thomas that, uh, including his book, Guardians of the Galaxy, which I highly recommend everybody gets, um, I don't even know where to start. So, Thomas, can you give us a few highlights of your career, please? Oh, thanks. Thanks for having me, Gavin. Uh, yeah, I, I've, I've been in security for about 30 years, but I spent 24 years of, in the CIA retiring there. Um, I, I had a hybrid security career. I started out in, in some of the more basic um, aspects of, of uh, security, like personnel security, clearance processing, et cetera, um, and then security operations center. And then I ended up uh, moving into protective operations as part of a unit that uh, became famous with Benghazi, uh, the, the attack in, in 2012. And, um, and then I, I, I got into counterterrorism where I worked undercover in a variety of hostile places. Um, and then I kind of moved up in the ranks and ended up doing um, being the head of security in war zones. So uh, a, a little different than the average security career at, at the agency. Um, and uh, I hit basically every war zone from 93 until uh, 2013. Wow, <laughs> that's impressive. Uh, and you're here to sell the tail, which is even more impressive. So, uh, yeah, so for everybody watching, uh, please hit the like and subscribe. Um, you're going to love this. And we're going to have some tips for you uh, dotted and peppered throughout this, which you're going to be able to use in your, your everyday life to help keep yourself safe too. So, uh, so yeah. Um, wow. Well, what, what a way the world has gone recently. Uh, security has taken a huge turn, both digitally and physically in, in the sense of, you know, now there's, there's a fine line between safety and security and the invasion of privacy. What are your views on that, Thomas? Oh, yeah, the world has dramatically changed. Uh, when I went to the agency in 1989, um, which, by the way, we call it the agency. We don't call it the company. Uh, <laughs> you automatically know that somebody isn't a part of it when they use that term. Um, that movie land. But uh, yeah. yeah. In 89, uh, the Middle East and, uh, the, the, and a lot of the countries in the Mediterranean were uh, uh, subject to a lot of terrorism, a, a lot of uh, low intensity conflict situations. And, uh, and then things calmed down over the, the next uh, decade or two. Uh, but in the last uh, five to 10 years, things have really changed back into, um, you know, countries have, have gone um, into chaos. So we've got mm -hmm. Libya that's that uh, used to be under pretty much control now uh, the kind of the Wild West, mm -hmm. uh, we Yemen. <laughs> uh, we had things in Syria. So it, it, it's really uh, we've kind of got back in time to uh, some more dangerous um, period, especially with terrorism and radical Islamic um, activities, etc. Yeah, I was in I was in Libya Libya a short while ago, and um, I, I was coming through. I was on my way to Israel and and going uh, that way up um, through Palestine. And uh, yeah, it's uh, it, it's well, you 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 wouldn't want a holiday there with your children. Let's put it that way. <laughs> yeah. um, what do you think with what's going on with, with uh, Ukraine and Russia at the minute? I'm I'm you know I'm curious to, <laughs> with your views on that because. Uh, well, uh, yeah, that would that, that's a tough one. <laughs> I would say that the, the media has uh, has proven itself to be unreliable in, in a lot of its reporting. There's a lot of partisan uh, activity on both mm -hmm. sides of the fence, making it very difficult for the average person to get an idea on really what's going on um, in that conflict. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I think we have to sit back and, and, and really look at how much damage this is causing not only uh, to Ukraine and Russia, but uh, all, all through Europe and the, uh, the effect it's having on the United States and other uh, allies in this conflict. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I have some serious reservations about the, how this is being handled and the, the lack of peace um, negotiations. Uh, that, that, that seems to be uh, almost off the table. Yeah, and, I mean, it has uh, been back to the 
Yeah, I, I was actually, uh, um, a, a year or two ago, I can't remember exactly when it was, I, I was out visiting Chernobyl. Um, I've, I've been so curious about it ever since, you know, like the, the disaster in, was it 1984 or 1996? Anyway, um, yeah. you know, for years, you know, I was, I was curious about it. Anyway, long and short of it is, what I found out while I was there was that there's something like a trillion gallon of oil or something crazy underneath Chernobyl. Um, that nobody knew about, or if they did know about, for a long, long time, thought it wouldn't be any good because of all the, you know, the radioactive. Uh, you know, we, I mean, the whole disaster zone for a long time we thought was never going to be able to be set foot on again. Um, as it's come to light recently that more and more people are, are, are well not allowed to go there, but do go there, um, you know, and that kind of thing. Um, you know, they've realised that you, you know that things aren't quite so bad and things are settling down. And I, I, I was wondering whether you, uh, that's anything to do with that being Russia taking that area, you know, first more than anything. You know, <laughs> there, there's there could be a lot of different factors there. The fact that that NATO. Um, was moving, kind of creeping in and trying to get Ukraine to, to, to side with them when that was a buffer zone for, for Russia. Mm -hmm. um, just like uh, Cuba, uh, when, when the Russians moved in, in into Cuba, or at least they moved some rockets in, and the United States basically said, you've crossed the line that we, we can't mm -hmm. allow. Mm -hmm. So it, it's, it's getting a bit serious. Um, and uh, I, I don't think it's gone nearly like they might have planned by, uh, on any of the sides. Mm -hmm. so, uh, and that kind of chaotic, um, unpredictable uh, scenario, you want to kind of pull back or you'd hope that uh, reasonable governments would pull back and start looking at ways to mitigate or, or uh, uh, reduce or uh, end the conflict. But oh, yeah. uh, I'm no expert in, in, in Ukraine or uh, Russia. I spent most <laughs> of my time in, in the Middle East and uh, South America and Asia. So different oh, world. Right. Yeah, South America is interesting. We'll come back to that in a moment. But let's talk a little bit about the Middle East because it, it's surprising when you get out there how, you, you know, just one country to another, how, how many differences there are, um, uh, almost like you're on another planet, you know, another part of the world, just but just by going from one area to another. So were you were, were you out in Kurdistan for a while? or Because I can't remember. I know. No, I, 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 spent, uh, I spent I, my first overseas um, real adventure <laughs> using the term that Louis, like Louis L'Amour does that an adventure is a life threatening event that you survive. Uh, mm -hmm. In 1993, I ended up in um, in Mogadishu. Oh, wow. And, um, wow. and then later on, I worked in uh, in Gaza, in Israel. Um, mm -hmm. I was in Albania. I was in um, um, some other uh, countries along the north, the, the northern coast. <laughs> Yeah, so that were in serious conflict for uh, ten plus years, so I, I got a chance to see some of the countries um, a little bit before they went into into chaos, mm -hmm. and then uh, quite a lot of time in countries that were in serious serious chaos. Yeah, yeah. What were your thoughts on operating in Israel? Because that must have been pretty interesting. Well, I, I first started out um, actually uh, training. Uh, protective operations personnel and other bodyguards for uh, Yasser Arafat. Oh, uh, wow. this, was, <laughs> this was a government program uh, where the U.S. was helping them. Um, and then mm -hmm. I ended up in actually in Gaza working with um, a, pol a, a Palestinian uh, police unit. I was teaching them non-lethal defensive tactics. Mm -hmm. And uh, one of the funny stories that ended up, I was in their one of their, their – um, one of their office areas where they were working. And they said, yeah, this used to be an Israeli jail. And uh, I used to be an inmate here. And uh, <laughs> a bunch of the guys showed me the different offices that were cells that they actually occupied previously. Wow. So uh, kind of a bizarre, um, a bizarre change of fate going mm -hmm. from a prisoner to being a police officer <laughs> in, in, in your jail. Yeah. Well, and uh, could you, I believe you still offer training services at the moment as well, don't you? Or, or is it through somebody else? Or yeah, you... I, I I work with the uh, Curie Group, mm -hmm. uh, and I provide personal safety training uh, specifically on situational awareness, which is the the foundational element of all personal safety. Yeah, and um, and also some advanced uh, situational awareness training that is very specific to protective operations, personal bodyguards. 
uh, people in law enforcement and counterterrorism and in the military, looking at um, how to use your your situational awareness skills to um, uh, observe, recognize, and react to potential terrorist uh, surveillance, mm-hmm. which is a precursor to an attack. Yeah. Brilliant. I, I love that. And I'm going to personally endorse it because I know just the last time that you and I kind of linked up just for a coffee, uh, yeah. we, we both kind of automatically picked the same table, same spot, same everything else in there, yeah. you know, just, just completely aware. And just as we were talking, just both of us monitoring everything that's going on around. So uh, uh, I'm very, very aware of it. So, um, so I know. Um, and I, I've known you for years, Thomas. So uh, again, um, if anybody does want training in situational awareness um, or wants to know more about it or anything like that, what I'll do, I'll put the link in the show notes. If that's okay with you, Thomas, send it over to me. Put it in underneath, and uh, let's let's see if we can get a few people over there because it's it's well worth doing. Um, most people, like you say, they don't realise when when you, you 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 said the right words when you said it's the foundation of everything. It really is because you you can be trained in so many things. You could you can be a black belt in whatever martial art. You can be, uh, you know, take all the, the tactical shooting courses in the world, anything you want. But if your situational awareness is dull, then you, you you've lost. You've got no chance before you've even started. So absolutely, yeah. yeah. Attention but, gives you time, and time gives you options. Yeah, 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 and that's uh, that's something that uh, that we we we're both very familiar with. That's for sure. So, um, so yeah, um, right. Um, so, so the, the highlights in in the Middle East. Would you like to let, us, let some of the people know some of the, the uh, um, ad, I like the word adventure, the adventures you've had. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, did, uh, I, I did my first um, adventure uh, in uh, Somalia <laughs> in, uh, in uh, 1993. Mm-hmm. I was there uh, just before Black Hawk Down. I was uh, uh, part of a protection team for uh, our personnel who were uh, working with the military trying to uh, acquire the location of uh, Mohammed Farah Adid, who um, became a, a, a basically a fugitive to the UN after he his uh, folks attacked a, a UN convoy. And um, those were some crazy times out I'll say that um, the threat level was extremely high. At mm-hmm. one point, we, we were uh, facing uh, potential surface-to-air missiles, so our, our supply mm-hmm. flights couldn't get in. We ended up uh, basically raiding our emergency supplies in a, that we had in a tent. And um, that's where I, I, I found out that there's all kinds of interesting things that happen with food in a war zone. <laughs> uh, they said uh, 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 they had these canned uh, meat they called uh, potted meat product. And uh, I wasn't sure if it was still good. It was canned, it was still sealed. So I opened it up and threw it on a log and uh, a bunch of starving Somali cats came running over, <laughs> took one sniff and, and walked off. I said, well, from that moment on, I'd like, that's definitely off the menu. So, uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, th- that, there, was, there were multiple threats in that environment. Not only were we working uh, uh, to protect our people from the threat of uh, these um, warlords that were working black market um, activities against the uh, the UN uh, food um, services, but we we also had to deal with something kind of very unusual, which is the the largest unnatural shark population in the world hmm. is situated off the coast of of uh, Mogadishu in Somalia uh, because there was a meat packing plant there uh-huh. and they were throwing scraps in the water for decades. So it built up this population of sharks. And uh, at one point, a USAID worker, this is just uh, a, a month or so before I got there, well, was decided to go swimming hmm. and uh, she got attacked by a shark, it basically bit her in the leg some Canadian soldiers jumped into the water, got her out. But unfortunately, she passed away. So oh, you've yeah. got sharks on the coast and warlords <laughs> in the inland. Um, so the, the, the threat level was was pretty high. Mm-hmm. Oh yeah, without doubt. Um, and, and of course, you know, with a lot of the because um, a lot of people don't realize that pirate pirating is, is seasonal. Um, uh, which sounds really, really crazy. Um, well, we can go into more depth in that later. Um, but I, I've, I've actually seen images of like just boat after boat after boat vessels, all, all, all like 
for miles on the beaches. Some of them are just, you know, just raided of pretty much everything but the shell. Um, a very good friend of mine actually used to work, you know, negotiating the return of, of the vessels for the insurance companies and that kind of thing. But that, that's a, uh, another story. But if you had to uh, describe Mogadishu for, for anybody who's never been there, um, they've probably got an image in their head of what it's like. Um, and I'm pretty certain it's very different to New York. Uh, <laughs> so if you, if you could describe the it. The movie like, Mad Max. Yeah. Uh, there were, I mean, all the buildings were shot up. It was um, a pretty arid de desert type uh, environment. You had wild camels and animals running around acro crossing the streets in front of you. Um, there was no law and order whatsoever. Mm. Um, uh, no electricity, no running water, no restaurants. It was uh, pretty horrific. Um, wow. There was a power plant, a large power plant that had previously supplied power to Mogadishu mm -hmm. uh, proper. And that had been stripped to the bone. Like literally there were no, um, there's no copper left in it, no pipes, no electrical wires. <laughs> they stripped it all. Wow. So um, yeah, it's, it's the closest thing I've, I've come to Mad Max. The, the secondary close to that environment I was in was in Haiti. And this mm. is prior to the earthquake, so you can just imagine what that place. Oh right, yeah. Like after, and that's another place where, um, and there were no real maps. We were using uh, one of the most rudimentary uh, forms of GPS mm -hmm. um, just to navigate around the city of mm. Port-au-Prince. So, uh, been to a couple of places that that qualify in the in the. Roughly total chaos category. <laughs> and and what, what were the, the best memories of, of uh, South America? Because you, you, you've done a lot of work in South oh, America. Oh, well, I, I trained um, protection details everywhere from uh, Panama all the way down to uh, Argentina. Mm. One of the, my, my best memories is um, the Argentinians had a very young um, protective operations training uh, corps of, uh, of trainers. And they had gotten hold of a tape um, of a TV show in the U.S. called Top Cops. Mm -hmm. And they did op episodes of different um, interesting events that happened in the United States that, had, that were law enforcement based. And one of their episodes uh, was the story of uh, Jerry Parr, the U.S. Secret Service agent that saved Ronald Le Reagan's life uh, when uh, Hinckley shot, shot him. Mm -hmm. And... Um, uh, the Argentinian protective details, uh, the training division, uh, they got a hold of that tape and it had it dubbed in Spanish and they would uh, provide that to the, their new trainees mm -hmm. during their initial training class. So I was going down there to, to do a training class for them, for their uh, detail. And um, it was the week before the actual class we came in to, to coordinate and I walked in with uh, with a contractor from Secret Service and some, um, uh, well, I had a, an interpreter. And we walked in, and I I swear the 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 Argentinians turned around and they practically started bowing. And mm -hmm. I didn't get it until they walked up and said, "Is that Jerry Parr?" And <laughs> said, yeah, the, the, the contractor worked for me was Jerry Parr. Wow. And they all knew Jerry Parr from the video. <laughs> and um, uh, one of them ran in and called the, the actual president of Argentina. And uh, he invited us to a meeting later and he, he wanted to meet Jerry Parr. So wow. uh, the Argentinians were a very, uh, very uh, gracious group to work with. Uh, <laughs> and uh, yeah, that was a that was a, a very interesting um, couple of weeks of training. I'll they, bet, yeah. Uh, wow. Their idol was among them, so it was great. <laughs> Amazing. Well, now with, with surviving all that you've survived, here's the big and important question: Did you survive the hot dog machine at Langley? Is it still there, by the way? The, the, uh, the hot dog. <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't know. I, I will tell you this: some funny things about uh, about working in um, at the CIA headquarters. Um, we have uh, a Starbucks in there. Mm, yeah, store and, number one. Yeah, it's either yeah. yes, yeah, store number one. Uh -huh. It's either the, fir the 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 highest or the second highest um, grossing Starbucks uh, hmm. in the United States, if not, not maybe even the world. And when you walk in, it is a complete Starbucks. You mm -hmm. you the walls are Starbucks, the chairs, everything. Yeah, it's identical. It's very um, surreal. Uh, and, and there's uh, basically three times of the day when the place is packed. 
uh, at breakfast, lunch, and about mid afternoon when everybody's getting the caffeine fix. <laughs> so it, it, it's kind of a crazy. And um, so we've got that, and we've got kind of you know some fast food places like you know, yeah. Burger King in there. Crispy so yeah, it's an interesting uh, place to work. For, for for those who don't know, um, store number one, Starbucks is um, is the only only Starbucks in the world where they don't shout your name out when you've got your coffee done, <laughs> purely because of yes. the situation yeah. of the building it's in. <laughs> and and uh, quite a few of the people who are working in uh, in that environment are undercover. I spent yeah. twenty three out of twenty four years uh, undercover, which means that I was uh, I was not an open employee at the CIA. Mm -hmm. Um, my, my pay stubs had a different entity. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, yeah, when I traveled, um, so, uh, even, only my family, my immediate family really knew where I worked. Yeah. Uh, the other people basically, yeah, they got the cover <laughs> story. So, um, yeah, it was, it, it was some very interesting times. Um, some, some, uh, uh, the more funny side of it was when I got posted to Iraq and, um, Oh, four. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, 2004, um, the the Iraq situation was kind of going south on us. Uh, the the hostility against the Americans and the and, the, and the, basically the coalition kind of made things uh, a bit rough. And um, we uh, when I got there, uh, we were starting to get mortar rounds and uh, and rocket attacks and things, but um, it wasn't all. Uh, 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 terrible uh, work conditions because the, the agency has a, a history of being what we call wet. In other words, we have alcohol pretty much wherever we're posted. <laughs> <Yeah. Unlike America. laughs> in fact, um, in Iraq, in Baghdad, we had a bar which was called the Babylon Bar, mm. uh, kind of following that, uh, that Middle Eastern uh, motif. And we in, in that bar, we had pool tables. We even had a dance floor area with a disco ball in the whole nine <laughs> yards. And um, part of my duties was actually kind of bouncing the bar. So uh, making sure that people who were coming in, uh, you know, were identified and cleared. Yeah. People were not carrying firearms, which were common in a war zone. <laughs> yep. and, um, yeah. So some crazy stuff happened. Um, you could imagine you know, alcohol, high stress, and and weapons in the area <laughs> you get, get a bit strange i've no doubt so to give people a few takeaways let, let's let's go into the whole um kind of self personal safety and and, and that side of things that, i mean i i see so frequently um i i'm i'm a, a pretty fast walker most of the time I, I walk like kind of twice the speed of most people um maybe, maybe it's because i'm a little bit tall i don't know but uh but when, when i'm walking down there i'm co i'm constantly overtaking people all the time as i walk past them i go around them and i see people with with headphones on or, or earbuds in all the time and and i usually tend to try to give a wide berth and when I go past the amount of times it happens, people go, oh, you know, and you can see the frightened look on the face. Like, Where did you come from? Um, I, 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 and you know, things like that makes makes, I mean, literally makes them a walking victim. You know, they're they're on the way. When I used to go jogging, I used to have, you know, like the um, the acoustic um, tubing earpieces that the FBI use. Yeah. yeah, I used to have one of them plugged into my phone if I wanted music or anything while I was running. I used to have one in and and one ear free. Um, which gave me a huge advantage, obviously. Um, so there, there's the first tip for everybody. Um, but yeah, it, so it's really surprising. And that's not the only time I see it. I see it so frequently. People are just, they're, they're um, I mean, you're aware of the Cooper Color Code. They're, they're, uh, they're, 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 they're off the charts with it sometimes. So, you know, for, for, for people who are just wanting to kind of, you know, come from not having any awareness of even what situational awareness is, to working in the world of like, how do I improve this? What would be a couple of starting tips that you you could give to them to kind of, you know, look at? Well, look at going in the, into what you're talking about with headsets, um, you know, I, I, the only place that I felt comfortable jogging, and I was living in the D.C. area, I was mm -hmm. hopping out for 24 years, was um, actually on the CIA compound. And <laughs> even then, I, you know, if I was going to wear earbuds, that's where I would do it. Yeah. Uh, and even there, you had to watch out for people running you over because <laughs> parking lots. Yeah. So um, uh, I would, you know, I would say that um, the first step is whenever you leave what, what you consider a relatively safe um, location, like 
where you work or your home or someplace like that. Um, what you want to do is uh, mentally prepare before you leave those facilities, those, those locations, mm -hmm. uh, to, um, to be conscious of what's going on around you, to, to, to make an effort to move from what we call condition white in the Cooper colors, mm -hmm. um, the color codes that were assigned to different levels of awareness. So condition white is a condition where we are not aware of our surroundings. For example, when I'm at work and I'm typing away at something, um, I'm not really um, aware of what's going on around me. Or mm -hmm. if I'm home watching TV, um, I'm in a safe location or if I'm sleeping. But when you leave those locations, you go anywhere where there's uh, additional people, you're going to be outside of that safety zone. You want to up your awareness level to uh, what we call condition yellow, which is um, we call it street condition. Basically, mm -hmm. you are uh, scanning your environment. You're not looking for any specific threats, but you are aware of what's going on. Um, mm -hmm. And specifically, we're watching people, we're watching uh, activities, and we are focusing on the, um, the, the physical objects in our environment, you know, mm -hmm. buildings, walkways, cars, et cetera. So with that happening, we, we want to have our mind in the moment. We want to be present in the moment. And that will allow us to pick up on any anomalies in the environment. Mm -hmm. And anomalies, anything that just um, isn't supposed to be there or if something's missing in the environment that should be there. Uh, yeah. Hollywood does this all the time. They, when they want to get our attention in a movie, they will start to play ominous music in the background. Uh, <laughs> in our normal life, we don't have that. We don't no, have that. That's a shame. I'm, I'm disappointed with that, really. Yeah. <laughs> I have a complaint. In Hollywood, they'll also have the character, the main character, walk into a woods and he'll and they'll and they'll listen and they'll hear no birds chirping, no insects moving, nothing, not mm -hmm. even uh, maybe even leaves rattling. Mm -hmm. That lack of sound catches our attention. Mm -hmm. So it's things that shouldn't be there or things that should have been there. Yeah. So um, basically, anything that that is not normal in the environment mm -hmm. at that point. We need to focus on that. We need to shift our attention and put effort into that. And that is when we start to utilize a part of our brain called the amygdala, which is basically our snake brain. It's the, it's the oldest part of our brain. It's, it's the part of the brain that is concerned with only one, or one thing. Is it a threat or not? That's mm -hmm. all that part of the brain does. And what when we see something that's a potential anomaly, that, then we need to focus on it. And that process of focusing is when our, our amygdala, our brain starts to go, is this a problem or not? And that's when we, we call condition orange. That's where mm -hmm. we're, we're focused and we're deciding, is it a threat or not a threat? Mm -hmm. If we decide in that moment of the observation that it is a threat, then we're moving into condition red, which is action. We need to, we've got a threat and now we have to do something about it. And so our awareness levels change and they go up and down. If, I, if I'm driving along and I'm just scanning my environment and I see a ball roll across the street, that should get my attention, move me from condition yellow, street condition, to a more of a focus of orange. Because mm -hmm. my experience says if a ball rolls out in the street, oftentimes there's going to be a kid following it. Mm -hmm. So I yep. need to get in position to, to react. At that point, if I start to see somebody coming out from between the cars, uh, that's condition red. I've got a potential threat, maybe mm -hmm. not against my life, but theirs. So yeah. I need to react. I need to make a decision and act. So that's an example of kind of how, how we, we all are doing this to varying degrees. But what we need to do this is more consciously. Instead of just reacting um, more, um, more as a matter of it, it, uh, the environment forcing us, we need to be more aware of our environment and then making decisions. So, yeah. I think the, the British Army have a, a great saying for, for that, term, that kind of being aware of what you're looking for is the, uh, the, the, the presence of the abnormal and the absence of the normal. 
um, yes. and you know, which, which is absolutely okay. fantastic because it's not like you say, like you mentioned, it's not just about something that could be there; it's also about what should be there and isn't. You know, um, which which is, which is really really brilliant. Um, so yeah, and 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 then the most important thing. I mean, I, I'm sure you probably teach this now, and I'm sure it's towards in, in a lot of militaries. But for the, for the civilians watching, we have this kind of get off the X. You know, so if, if you if you find you're you're in a threatening situation or, or or in a situation where your life is in danger, don't stand there and freeze. You know, make make a mental plan instantly. I'm, I'm sure you talk about the OODA loop as well, but instantly say where am I going to go, what am I going to do, where's safe, and get to it. You know, so yes. and and a lot of that is, um, you want to have a plan figured out beforehand so that you oh, can sure. implement it um, immediately. And that plan should encompass something that will get you off the X. That the X is the location of the attack or the, um, you know, where they want you when they do a robbery or an assassination, et cetera. And um, there's all kinds of some really, you know, exotic technical things you can do with a car, bootlegs, J turns, et cetera. But what we found is, and this applies to um, uh, being uh, in, on foot also, mm -hmm. um, is if you focus on one word to help you break through the freeze that comes when we realize that there is a serious threat. Mm -hmm. um, and that, that word is move. Yeah. <laughs> Any type of motion that moves you off the X will immediately have a, a, a positive impact on your safety. And it's mm -hmm. going to reduce the ability of the bad guy to, uh, to, uh, to impact you because you're not where they want you to be. Yeah. yeah. So uh, whether it's a vehicle or walking, even in a fist fight, if you stand mm -hmm. still, you're going to get hit. If you move, mm -hmm. it's much more difficult. Moving targets oh. are hard to get. So, oh, for sure. Yeah. Move, move, uh, number one. And, and of course, the, the, the thing that's always helped me throughout the years is, is, is if, I mean, you, you know, when we went to that restaurant the once, with the, what we said was if you were an active shooter and you came in through the front door, where would you? Because a lot of them are not usually trained. They're running on adrenaline. And they're just spraying and, and whatever else. So it was where are they going to shoot from? Where are they less likely going to to kind of hit? And and, and let's put ourselves there. Um, and then you know after we've got ourselves in that position where where we're in a, in a less likely place that somebody's going to to, to start. Um, you know, red sell it where you're looking uh, from their perspective. Um, you know, and you're saying, well, where, where would I go? Where would I shoot? Um, and once you've established where the shooter or, or, or the threat is going to come from, then it makes it easier for you to work out your, your, your exit strategy. Um, because, you know, it, it kind of presents itself because if you know that way is blocked and this way is open, you know, you, you, you've worked Absolutely. it out for yourself. So otherwise, a lot of people get what is referred to as paralysis by analysis. And they're spending too much time thinking. They're sitting there going, oh, there's a threat. What's, is it real? You know, are they actually going to shoot? Is this a wind-up? Am I on television? Where do I get out? Do I go this way? You know, and, and they've got that many thoughts clogging up the funnel, if you want to call it that. I, I often think of them like marbles all coming down a funnel. And instead of one going down, dropping at a time, they all kind of clog up and everything stops. And then you get this this freeze, you know, the f fight, flight, or freeze scenario. People just freeze, and and the thoughts just stop. Um, so you've got to kind of, in advance, work out your exit strategy and say, right, that's it. You know, if 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 something happens, if there's a threat, that's my exit. That's where I'm running to, and that can buy you valuable seconds. You know, in in, in a situation where if something happens, you can run to that door. Uh, you know, and, and and you know that that's something I've generally had in mind. Don't get me wrong; it's fine to have a backup plan. You say, right, if that door's locked, then I'm going to this one or whatever. But but that's your primary plan in place. Yeah, uh, and, and it's good to call that an exit strategy because that helps you um, focus on what your priority should be, which yeah. is to get out. Because statistically, mm -hmm. regardless of of what kind of threat it is, in in almost every situation. Whoever reacts first and gets more distance from the threat has a higher survival rate. Mm -hmm. So um, there, there's two parts to that. One, you places that you frequent uh, regularly, you need to know where your primary exits and entrances are, mm -hmm. secondaries, emergencies. Um, you want to have a couple of different options. 
environmentally, you also need to be looking at it from the point of view of what's what's in the environment that can help me. Um, mm -hmm. Is there security? Is there first aid kits? And also, is there something that will provide me with some protection from, uh, say, rifle or pistol uh, yeah. fire? Okay, so that's what we call cover versus concealment. Mm -hmm. Cover is something that actually stops the bullet. Uh, concealment is just something that hides us from view. Yeah. They're both important, but one works better than the other. <laughs> um, but so when you combine your list of what you need and in, in, you need to reduce it down to kind of simple and sustainable. We, that's why we like KISS is not keep it simple, stupid. Mm -hmm. It's keep it simple and sustainable. Mm -hmm. So the number of, of items that we can focus on are, are kind of limited under threat. We want to have a plan in advance. So if it's a location that we frequent, we need to have those specific things in our environment preloaded in our brain, knowing in advance that if there's a fire, if there's an active shooter, if there is some type of threatening event, I'm going to utilize the, the you know this emergency exit. And if that's blocked, I'm going to, I'm going to take this chair and push it through this window mm -hmm. and I'm going to get out that way. Um, so there's, there's a couple of things we need to focus on. The other part of this is um, if you're going into an area that you're not familiar with. It's the first time to this mall. It's the first time to this restaurant. Uh, take a second as you're walking in to mm -hmm. observe the area and look for your alternate exits. That is one of the reasons why uh, in a lot of movie theaters, they have this little um, safety briefing in the beginning. They say, mm -hmm. take a moment to look around and spot the other exits in the theater. The reason mm -hmm. for that is we have a tendency under stress to only remember what we just yeah. did. Yeah. So we only know that one exit. Well, that's where the bad guy is. Mm -hmm. um, that's not where we want, where we want to go. Mm -hmm. There's also a pre-planning attitude that we have to add to this. And that attitude is what we call choose safety. It's our mantra. In other words, we're going, we're making a decision before anything happens that I'm going to choose safety regardless of the circumstances. And um, if I make a mistake in this area, uh, it's a, it's what we call a area on the side of caution. In other words, if I hear something like fireworks when I'm in a building, I'm out the door. Mm. I'm not waiting to find out whether it's fireworks or an active shooter in the front mm. office. Yeah. Um, when you when you factor that in, I'm going to be one of the first ones out. Therefore, my survival rate is is at its highest level. Yeah. Um, if you don't choose safety as a default policy, you're mm -hmm. going to be one of the people that stand around, look at each other and go, was that fireworks? <laughs> I'm not sure. I don't like yeah. fireworks. Five minutes later, you're still in the office and then the bad guy comes in. That's it. Yeah. Right. Yeah. If, if, yeah, if you, you know, if you hear something like, like we say, like we're saying about the presence of the abnormal absence of the normal, if you hear something that is not normal, um, you know, why would somebody be letting fireworks off in a building? Don't don't stop to find out if it is. Don't yeah. what you know it, it's better to come back later looking stupid you know, and say, Hey, I'm sorry, I thought that was an active shooter, or you know, I didn't know what that was. I decided to get to safety and you're alive, yes. then the alternative if you if you if yeah. you turn and that we have to fight that that uh, that fear of stigma of, of being stupid. And mm -hmm. the and the greatest example of this is in the animal kingdom. If an antelope sees a lion, mm -hmm. he's not going to go near it under any circumstance. <laughs> no. So if, if you put an antelope into a building and that antelope walks up to an elevator and the elevator door opens and there's a lion in there, there's no way you're going to get that antelope into the elevator. <laughs> now, looking at humans... They will stand in front of an elevator. The elevator's doors will open. They'll see somebody in the in the elevator that strikes them as potentially dangerous, and they'll still get in the elevator because they don't want to make that person feel um, bad, and they don't want to look silly. Yeah, um, that's a perfect example of social engineering working against us yeah. in terms of our personal safety. We need to be strong enough and decide in advance that if we see something we don't like, we're not going to play that game. We're not mm -hmm. going to get in that elevator. Now, I like to do a little acting when I do this. I want to do the old tap my pockets and go crap and turn around and walk away. Yeah. So 
people around me are going to go, oh, he, he forgot something rather than he didn't want to get on that elevator. Yep. And there's a variety of times that we need, we can put acting into our, into our game. Oh yeah. Um, we're walking down the street and we, and, and our phone rings and the environment is not conducive to taking a phone call. Mm-hmm. You know, we're going to, we're going to duck into a shop or get into an area where we can answer the phone. Yeah. Or if we feel somebody's behind us and we don't like that position, we may pull to the side, put our back against the wall, pull our phone out, even though it's not ringing. It's not, there's no text message, pretend to be looking at the phone, but using our peripheral vision to see yeah. if there's a potential threat. There's a variety of ways we can implement the choose safety mantra. And in mm-hmm. almost every case, it's to our advantage. Yeah, I, I like that what you said about the line and the lift and, and the whole the whole like kind of improvising at the lift. If there's somebody in there that you you know you look at them and you instantly think, "Am I safe?" Getting into what is effectively a metal box Absolutely. with this person, you know, um, it, you know, if it was a cage, you know, you know, a no rules cage fight, you know, in a in a what six foot by six foot box, would wow. you get in it? You know, yeah. and if, if the answer is no, then yeah, um, and of course, if you don't want to tap your pocket, if you don't want to do any of that. You're, you're under no obligation to right. enter that box. You know, I know societal pressures are there because of the fact that, like you say, socially we've been engineered, we've, we've been kind of, you know, brainwashed into thinking, oh, we must get in because it's rude if, you know, if, if, if we don't. You know what? I'll be rude. I don't care. <laughs> I'll, um, I'll, I'll, I'll be rude. You can take your chances. Uh, I'll turn around and I'll, I'll get the next lift. Thank you. Or elevator, or whatever, whatever, whatever you want to call it. Reason for the sayings, the old sayings: uh, 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 an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. Oh yeah, for sure, definitely. The, the avoidance factor. We like to look at safety uh, from the point of view of everything and anything that I can avoid is mm-hmm. a success story. Um, so anything that I potentially see as a problem, I'm working on my avoidance strategies, mm-hmm. and um, and then if I can't do that. Then it's mitigation. Yeah. Worst yeah. case scenario is that you're actually in an altercation, mm-hmm. mm. and you, and then you have to do de-escalation if it's possible. If that's not possible, then you better be able to to um, to defend yourself. Yeah. So. yeah. I'll, I'll quickly go back as well to what you were saying about the exits in, in the theatre and that kind of thing. You, you've also got to bear in mind when you're working out your extra exit strategy, if if a threat does come from whichever direction, ask yourself where is everybody else going to be running. Because if the obvious door is the one that everybody else is running to and and that's going to be blocked with crowds, then pick another one. <laughs> um, because because you know, at the end of the day, you don't want to be caught in that crowd or waiting at the well, back. Join the, the queue if you don't have to. No, no, get get to another one. Um, and if you if you have no choice and you, you ha- tread over people, get the hell out of there. There's not it's not a time I to mean, be polite, yeah. it's a time to save your life. Yes. <laughs> I mean this this can this is um uh, these are these are methods and, and philosophies that work everywhere. I'll give you an example. When I get on a plane, I um, I know enough of, because of my background. I know exactly um, based on the studies. And these are studies done by engineers. What is the safest place on a plane? Now, the old the the old uh, axioms was you want to be um, in the back of the plane or. Uh, and you want to be in an aisle, uh, in a, pardon me, a window seat. The reason for that was one of the, the threats back in the day was hijacking. Mm-hmm. And hijackers moving up and down the aisles used to pistol whip uh, the passengers. Mm-hmm. And if you're by the window, you're safer from, you're out of reach, basically, of, of a hijack. Mm-hmm. Now, nowadays, hijacking is not really uh, happening because mm-hmm. uh, passengers just won't allow it. They, mm. they will consider it a, a terrorist attack that they're going to use the plane and crash it, and they're not mm. going to play along. So mm. um, looking at, at structural data on crashes, the, the safest place on a plane or is about midsection in an aisle seat within four to five rows of an exit. Now, that last part is really important because um, so many people who survived the crash don't survive the exit mm-hmm. because you have about 90 seconds to get out of there before the, the, the heat and the fumes will knock you out and kill you. Yeah. So um, 
picking a seat on an aircraft that is an aisle seat within four to five rows mm -hmm. is a lifesaver. And then you add on some other uh, aspects. The first thing I do when I sit down is I pull up the safety card in the aircraft and I look at it to look at the exits on the plane. And the second thing I'm looking at is how to operate the doors. Some doors are push down mm -hmm. and pull in. Others yeah. are pull up and push out or a, ver a variety of different ways. And uh, the planes differ. Yeah, I want to know exactly how to operate that door because I intend to be the first one there. <laughs> oh, exactly. Yeah, I, I mean to put that into perspective for people, if you can imagine that the, the you know imagine that this plane is, is it's it's crashed, it's on the ground, uh, or, or just just to start with, think about the fact that when it lands, from the minute that door first opens, you know, in a normal landing, if you're sitting in the middle of the plane, how long does it take you to get out? You know, this is just people grabbing their bags and walking out. Nobody wants to be there. Nobody wants to hang around. Yeah, look at how long it takes you, you know, and, and, and then put that into perspective of if you're in the plane and it's now crash landed and you have 90 seconds to get out, are you going to make it? You know, if you're in the middle of the plane, are you going to make it? Look at the, look at where you are. Look at the people around you. And despite what people say about kind of, you know, oh, well, you know, the, the, the rules say don't grab your hand luggage, don't grab your coat, don't do this stuff. People will. That's People right. Do all sorts because of they're not thinking about it, and yeah. they're going to rely on uh, on the automatic habits that they have built over years. Yeah, and that's yeah. why we we have to kind of do the reverse. We've got to build up new habits mm -hmm. that uh, that work towards our safety. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Without doubt. Um, so again, that that in itself is, is you have to have your exit strategy in place, even on the plane, in every scenario, whether it's on the water, whether it's on land. Well, no matter, you know, if your plane is floating and you know you need to get out onto the wings, have that exit strategy in place because at the end of the day, you know, even if you you do upset and annoy a few people on your way out, shall we say, um, mm -hmm. does it matter if you're alive? You're probably never going to see them again, you know, but the main thing is you're alive, you know, <laughs> so Absolutely. at the end of the day, that's what are our priorities? It's saving ourselves or family members, et cetera. Yeah. And it's not to the detriment of other people. We're just we're we're implementing um, plans and procedures that we thought about in advance so that when we're under stress, we don't have to do a hard think because mm -hmm. the truth is we can't. No. That's where people make a mistake. They think that they're actually going to have time to uh, say noodle this, to, to work through it in their head, and they won't. We no. just don't have the time. Uh, the, there's going to be so much data coming at us, and that's why we have to have a plan in place that we just push the button and do yeah, but not only that, you will be under that kind of fight or flight adrenaline rush, which will just give you a tunnel vision and, and, and you know, you'll lose a lot of your motor skills and your fine thinking abilities and that kind of thing. And, you, you know, you, you're going to be down to your animal instinct. So if you've already got it locked in place in the event of X, I'm going to do Y, then that's it. That's, that's what's going to stick with you. And that's what's going to happen. You know, Absolutely. rather than running in circles, screaming, going, what do I do? <laughs> so, brilliant. Thomas, we are coming up to the hour uh, and it's flown because as, as ever, when it, whenever I talk with you, whether it's in person or whether, whether it's on the internet, I just, you know, I just, I just enjoy myself so much. It's just brilliant. I love talking about this kind of thing. Will you come back on at some other time? Come and join us again and give Absolutely. some explosion tips. Fantastic. Brilliant. Um, and for anybody interested, where can they find you? Where's the best place to look for you? Uh, I'm on LinkedIn. And I'm also I, I have a book uh, that I wrote about my career. And it's it's a dual my career in the, the CIA and also the um, it's the prequel to the 13 hours book and movie about the, um, the CIA protective operations element that saved the lives of the State Department people in mm -hmm. Benghazi in 2012. That book is called Guardian. Life in the Crosshairs of the CIA's War on Terror. And that's uh, available on Amazon, Audible, uh, and Kindle. Yeah. Um, yeah, I've also, we have a website, uh, thomas-pecora.com. Oh, thomas-pecora.com. It's uh, got uh, photos from the book and uh, podcasts and uh, uh, articles about uh, my life and, and, and uh, uh, my career. Wow. 
Yeah, that's brilliant. I've actually got the hardback copy. It's about that thick. It's a lo lovely, great, big, thick book. It's fantastic. So, um, in the last ten minutes, is there anything that uh, that I've missed that you think you know might be important to let people know, or any any great tips that you think uh, is going to be good to share? Well, anybody who who's, who stops and thinks about their personal safety and starts to to look at it as um, as their personal responsibility, you've mm -hmm. got an edge over everybody. And this is not about being paranoid. This is about being prepared. Mm -hmm. Those are two dramatically different words. And one, the, the, the panic part is debilitating. Uh, it's demoralizing um, and it's ineffective. What yeah. we want to be is in the prepared side. And mm -hmm. part of pre preparation is um, having a mindset that we're going to survive. Mm -hmm. And the underlying thing in a survival mindset is the, the, the understanding and belief that bad things can happen, but we're going to do something about it so that we are prepared to act. And that is an empowering thought that energizes okay. and gets us where we need to go. Oh, yeah. And of course, I mean, there are societies of preppers for all to all sorts of things for, you know, different, different scenarios from, from disasters and economical breakdown and that kind of thing. You know, we're not suggesting that you, you go out and buy a million dollars worth of canned goods or anything like that, you know what I mean? But, uh, but, but, you know, just a little bit of time for, for, for preparing, uh, you know, because th th there are this, there's this reputation of anybody ha that does this preparing for, for for any kind of a disaster they go oh you're paranoid or you're you know you, you you're kind of you, you're a disaster um whatever you know and, and that's not the case everybody by rights is is a prepper of sorts you know you have a spare tire on your car doesn't mean you're going out because you want to puncture or you want you're going to start driving over nails left right and center because you've got one you know you have a first aid kit in your home possibly um you know it doesn't mean to say you want to start i mean slicing parts of your limbs off or anything like that the bottom line is it's just about having a little bit of forethought so in the event of emergency you've got a plan you've got what it takes to be able to say this is how we deal with it um and the most important thing is not the physical things it's not your first aid kit it's not the equipment you've got it's none of that it's this yeah absolutely it's your ultimate weapon and a great example of that are the parents that have small children the mm -hmm. stuff they have in their bag they got something in case they're the kid needs to change his shirt, diaper, needs a snack, something to yeah. drink. Oh, that little bag. Well, oh, yeah. here we go. That's that's um, presence of mind. That's um, forethought. And that's preparation. And yep. um, if you can do that, you can prepare for almost any of these uh, potential incidents. Yeah. My daughter's 10. I still don't leave the house without a bag of wet wipes and all sorts of things. <laughs> <laughs> Brilliant. Thomas, thank you once again. Um, for everybody who joined, thank you for being here. Uh, please hit the like and subscribe. Tell your friends, especially if they're going to find this useful. Um, and uh, please leave your thoughts in the comments on what you think of uh, what we discussed and if you've got any tips to share as well. Thank you very much. Thanks, Kevin.